U på Vesterbro, Westbridge Christmas, the 2003 show review. So, whether you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, anything else religious or anything non-religious or nothing at all, I wish you and the people you care about happy holidays. I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I loved though there are a lot of offensive elements to it and I will be criticizing those this video will have some jokes and we'll get into some serious topics yeah it's been 20 years since this first aired so I decided to do a video on it and uh, right if you're looking for a review that's like oh the show doesn't really hold up it's been outdone by later shows because that it's not that much fun to watch today whether you agree with that assessment or not this is not that review I realize this video is long I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time this video is a review where I'm almost definitely not gonna spoil anything if I decide over the course of the video that I will I'm gonna verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so until I'm done spoiling, so you can mute and skip head and choose see me lower my index finger. If you want my spoilerful thoughts on individual episodes, the link to them will be in the description box. And let's dive right in. So, yeah, this was written by the the stand-up comedians Thomas Hartman and Anas Madison, and the DJ Nikolai Pike, who works for oh wow I had no okay he's he's written other stuff as well I I and even directed some stuff but yeah um otherwise DJ for the Danish rap group East Coast Hustlers or East Coast Hustlers creating the beats Hotman is better at writing than delivering comedy. And at the time was a stand-up comedian, like Anas Madison also was at the time. So, in the early to mid-2000s, I watched and loved a lot of Danish stand-up, which obviously raises the question, why wasn't I watching British stand-up? And honestly, it's primarily that it was much easier to get my hands on Danish stand-up. These days, almost all the, the stand-up I watch is, is British. I watch a little bit of American now, from here on out, I will be referring to Anas Madison as the Duck, or simply Duck, the English translation of his Danish nickname, Etten, which is derived from his first name. The good things about him and his work, uh, talent for the following types of comedy, verbal, silly, absurdist, shock, blue, musical. He has created characters that have lasted for decades, including Stuart Stardust, who is the lead in this. He has a strong appeal for children and teenagers and uses that to talk about issues that affect them often without being condescending. For a while he worked on children's radio. I was a huge fan of his between 1999 and 2010. Eventually I stopped for reasons that will become clear momentarily. Nowadays I can still go back and watch some of the stuff he released in that period. I'm really not interested in anything he's made since then. Growing up, despite living in a part of Copenhagen where you have to be able to hold your own in a physical fight, he was never particularly good at that. So, like many other comedians, initially, comedy was a form of self-defense for him. Growing up with some painful situations, he responded by writing and delivering very harsh jokes. Unfortunately, it would sometimes deteriorate into him just not having empathy for others since he himself was treated with so little empathy when he was growing up. Even when he was tremendously popular in his 20s and 30s, he would still make jokes like he was an edgy teenager who, due to age, had no control over his circumstances. And then he started going back and forth between harsh jokes and trying, and usually succeeding, to make jokes without being harsh. He would blame his audience rather than himself for embracing anger for so long. His racism, his misogyny, and classism showed his ugly face in almost every single thing that he's put out that I'm aware of. So again, between 1999 and 2010, sometimes only briefly. And yes, a lot of Danish and other Western people, comedians were making racist jokes at the time, but at least one of them, Jakob Tinglev, mocked the racism and quite well at that. In fact, I'm, I've been going back and forth on whether or not I, I yes, I'm just briefly going to repeat Jakob Tinglev's joke. So he said... You know, he's, he starts by saying, you know, sometimes I watch TV and I see those Muslims and I just think, 
Oh, I hate them so much. But then the nurse comes in with my medication and then everything's so good. Okay, good again. And yes, obviously it would have been great if he could have made that joke without targeting a different minority. But at the time, you know, mental health care was... There was a lot of, of good in Danish mental health care, and there was but there was a lot of racism. And so, yeah, Duck does not get a pass. Also, Jimmy Carr was active during that same time. Having watched a number of hours of stand-up from both of them, I can say with confidence, Jimmy Carr does not lack empathy. His offensive jokes are actually jokes, not just him finding a way to make it sound like a joke. What is just his bitter opinion about something... He does it because it's taboo and he can relieve some tension, not because he feels it and knows he can get away with it if he makes it sound like jokes. Now, to be clear, if you prefer Duck to Jimmy Carr or if you don't like either of them, that's perfectly fine. I'm not telling you you have to like Jimmy Carr. I'm just saying there is a difference. You know, obviously, if you don't like, you know, harsh jokes, you know, you, you have to be extremely selective with what you watch of Jimmy Carr. A lot of it is the the very harsh stuff. I've watched everything that he's put on his, or that has been put on his YouTube channel. I, d I doubt he's the only person running that thing, but yeah. Um, if hypothetically the duck, instead of performing stand -up comedy, did blogs or vlogs where, and he opened the very first of them by saying the following, which he did actually say in a stand-up performance. So, yeah. The following is a quote. This is not something I think myself. When I go in, into a Mexican restaurant, I don't want anything Mexican in there other than the food. The food is no longer Mexican. It's Danish. Make me the food. Keep the rest of your culture to yourself. It shouldn't even be in your own establishment. End quote. There would definitely still be a certain percentage of people who supported him, but a lot of the people who consider him funny wouldn't be among them. This show contains all of the good and all of the bad, and it is the best I've seen of Duck's work. One of the best things about this Christmas calendar is that with so much time spent on these characters, we actually do get some empathetic, sympathetic portrayals of most of the characters over the course of it. It's not so one-sided as most of his material is because there he spends so little time on individual people. Like, you know, this is not the first time he's talked about, like, young drug addicts, for example. There's, you know, he's done jokes about young drug addicts asking for money. You know, the character of Danny Stardust on this show is basically that, but because it's not just, you know, Duck telling a stand-up joke where he's like, oh, so, you know, I was dealing with this drug addict asking for money, you know, that that's that very much paints it as a negative thing. But here we actually see him in in tender moments. A bunch of the material can still be shallow and unsubtle. You know, he did do a lot of children's radio. That's not necessarily the place for depth and subtlety. This was released after 9-11, which led to a lot of anxiety around Muslim immigrants, especially dark-skinned ones from the Middle East. But it was before the Muhammad drawings in 2006, where the Islamophobia hit a peak. And this is very much one of those things that would not get made today. And I think a strong case could be made that... That would not have, it would not be such a bad thing if this didn't exist, or if at the very least it wasn't so Islamophobic. I have spent countless hours of my life watching stand up comedy. That's right, for some reason, no one has been able to count them. That's a weird owl joke. And that's more than enough to realize that at least 30 to 40 percent of all the stand up that I've at least watched, maybe there's some in languages I don't speak, but Danish and English. It's just white men expressing frustration that they're expected to empathize with anyone not a straight white cis man. I will be very happy if I go the rest of my life without ever once again hearing a man talk about how funny he thinks it is that countless straight men lie to women, especially about being in love with them, wanting a long-term relationship with them just so they can have sex with them, or whine about how rare it is for their female partner to want to have sex with them. Now, the Duck started his career hating on the work and identities of other people, and I think it's a lot healthier to be creating your own, so I'm glad he did eventually start doing that. 
and I realized he didn't have the connections to do that immediately, but I don't think it was worthwhile for him to be doing it either, and I think it may have come from a place of insecurity, as, you know, right, I wrote this a couple of months ago, um, yeah, if you still remember the, the whole iDubs thing, you know, he admitted that was where his shock humor came from. I do want to acknowledge that some of the humor of this show and of the duck in general is definitely that we're laughing at how ridiculous what is being said is. Some, or, or you know, done or the like. It's not actually that we condone it. Like, obviously the jokes about pedophilia are not supposed to normalize pedophilia. We're laughing only because of how wrong it is. But unfortunately, not all viewers appreciate that. And I'm not saying everyone has to be careful to think of every single potential misunderstood punchline. But you do when you are dealing with very real hate, su hate such as is the case with Islamophobia and transphobia. And yeah, there's a lot of misogyny. Women are constantly being reduced to objects, you know, such as sexual. They're prostitutes, sometimes forced into sex. They're compared to animals. It relies on misogynistic tropes, suggesting they don't listen when, you know, in actuality, women listen much better than men. Are irrational when men are worse at that, like. For every bad decision you think has been made by a woman who was jealous of another woman, which is patriarchy, that's not endemic to women, or like, oh, you know, she was on her period, or pregnant, or something like that, so many worse decisions, and, and like, decisions that got a lot of people killed, have been made by men who were jealous, or like insecure like male fragility is responsible for so much misery pain even death throughout history back to the the tropes claiming they manipulate which even on the statistically speaking rare occasion that it happens is driven by patriarchy leaving no other options for a number of women it's ridiculous to expect them to just accept starving to death the show does a pretty good job of making it varied, how the different characters respond to each other, though a lot of pairings and exchanges bear resemblances to each other, since there's not more than about half a dozen major characters, not a huge variety of settings, and the characters don't change that much over the course of it. So, yeah. Um, real quick. Ranking worst to best... Ranking everything, Duck, that I've watched slash listened through except this, and yeah. Um, Perforama, Simon, What Goes Around. I forgot to translate some of these. Okay, so one of them is called Telegeo Tiburton, Tios Jubileum, which, yeah, so. Speaking for the children, let's go with that. Ten year. Yeah, anniversary. Den Ektiva, which the the real thing, I guess, live. Uh, let's see, yeah, Anton Pocoke or the Duck on Coke. The the radio show Vesnakarum. What are you talking about? The yeah, the radio show of this, the movie Reine Yata, which uh, I think that one does have. I'll I'll real quick find. So in English, it is. Is there really not a title for it? I guess there's not a title for it. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Pure Hearts. Uh, Madison Hartman. Bude Bude Kupman, which I guess, let's go with Trading Places, where the, the two of them write a set for the other to perform. The, yeah, the, um, the live show of What Are You Talking About? The Trouble with Turkle. On radio, the, tr the Trouble with Turkle on film. Yes, I do think that the film is slightly better than the radio, though both are great. Tale for the which translates into Speak for Yourself, the nine-year anniversary, and Anas Madison Vena to Bay, Anas, yeah, Anas Madison Returns. And I should probably have gotten into, so the, yeah, this is a Nordic Christmas calendar which apparently, I, I have to admit, I can barely imagine, like, being 
you know, being a child celebrating Christmas and not watching a Nordic Christmas calendar. I assume that Americans had that, but apparently, so so according to Wikipedia, it's yeah, we Danes have it, Swedes, Norwegians, Finns, the uh, Icelandic people, and the Faroese, yeah, all have it. And oh wow, I didn't realize. Okay, it's from ninth the yeah, 1957 in Sweden was the very first. But but yeah, um, so yeah, each of these series consists of 24 episodes that air daily, beginning on the 1st of December, ending on Christmas Eve. And, let's see... The... Right, and yeah, the first Danish one was in 1962. And... Yeah, and this one is the... the yeah, some of them are for children, some are for both children and adults. This one is purely for adults. And let's see. Yeah, and I would say there's maybe five filler episodes of the 24 where nothing will really progress, nothing will happen that hasn't before, that sort of thing. In honor of the deteriorating Christmas tree, there are a number of needle drops, in addition to the dozen or so original songs. And, yeah, the, the pilot here is great. Or, yeah, the season opener is great. Introduces most of the major characters, sets up the initial conflict. Not every single character does appear in it, but it would have been impossible to fit all of them in. And within not that many more episodes, the rest of them are introduced. And like countless other TV shows, every episode of this opens with an intro sequence. As it plays, so does the chorus of the titular rap song on a loop. It gets old even the very first time it loops. I don't know why they didn't just write a few lines to go in between the repeats of the chorus. Evidently, no one working on this actually listened to what the music on the loop would sound like. The you know and I and I I love rap music and I love that title song but holy crap the intro features every major character including in episodes that they don't appear in and at least some of them before they've been introduced on the show itself those aspects of the visual side of the intro are acceptable but the following isn't several of the characters it spoils some of the major later appearances when really dramatic things happen gives away several major plot twists right from the first episode. Like, I get that they wanted something dramatic for the intro, but they should have just written something more dramatic for the very early episodes, or maybe have something that's like, okay, that must have happened because of, you know, who this character is, but it's not actually... Like, you know, the first episode has Danny, the, the son of, the, of Stuart Stardust, returned from, from prison... The intro could be him, like, maybe getting arrested and, like, have him do something characteristically really stupid. Like, maybe he's he's obviously being caught for something and he's, like, acting like, what, I didn't do anything wrong, you know. And, and yeah, him being arrested would be dramatic. The finale is quite good, though it feels just the fact that it doesn't, how do I say this without spoiling? It feels like a letdown after all the, the setup. Though it is well worth noting, it does resolve everything. I think, I'm not sure I know an advent calendar that doesn't, but yeah. Every episode was directed by Morten Lorentzen. And he used to be a comedian and you know before he became a director so he's great at directing comedy he really you know sometimes when you watch a comedy it's like okay this is not like I I'm a big fan of Hitchcock not as a person he did some really awful stuff but as a director some of I, I suppose it's in part also because it was you know near near the end of, of his life I want to say it's called I'm going to find it real quick. Yeah, Family Plot from 1976. Like, 
there were other times where Hitchcock clearly demonstrated that he had a strong sense of humor, but it's just, it's not quite as funny as it's supposed to be, and it, it kind of could be. Like, the, the cast are game. The cast are not holding back. But, like, you know, so, so yeah, 1976, this is the same year as... I'm just going to make sure I get the title right, because sometimes I get it wrong. Murder by Death, which is a substantially funnier movie. You know, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, Hitchcock was primarily a director of, like, thrillers. You know, he was known as the master of suspense. And that doesn't necessarily translate that well to, to comedy. And, yeah. With with this, with Westbridge Christmas, it's very much a case of, no, this guy gets what's funny. This is practically a sitcom, but with no laugh track and a looser camera. You have a put-upon family father, a difficult son, family expenses, they deal with social issues. And... Uh, yeah, so briefly from Wikipedia, the Christmas calendar is satire on the way Christmas is traditionally presented in television by instead presenting drug addicts, gangsters, and religious fanatics, and a social realistic parody on the underclass. And when possible, it's filmed and edited like a social realism drama. And so, let's see. Yeah, so Stuart Stardust retired from being, you know, he he used to be a sailor, then he was an entertainer for a while. He retired from being an entertainer, but that doesn't stop him from frequently cracking jokes and explains the songs he sings, though a lot of other people really want him to stop making those jokes. Sometimes he's indifferent, sometimes depressed, sometimes he gets into uncontrollable murderous rage, and some of these mood swings can be very abrupt. And, let's see, so yeah, um, hmm. is that, I feel like that's, huh, um, okay, yes, so uh, yeah, his son Danny is on parole, which of course means that they have to make sure that things are, <laughs> that he has a, a stable home and every so often his voice breaks he's very immature and Randy is Danny's girlfriend she is a yeah of a druggie and a prostitute and her hair is always greasy unwashed it's hard work to keep it out of her mouth she mispronounces words. She's much, she's very childish, like Danny. She enjoys teasing Stuart about Tove, the prostitute he frequents. She has her ring finger and middle finger, of, I think it's her right hand, in a cast. And she and Danny can be quite sweet together when they're not arguing. Truly, when they are as one, there is nothing they cannot do. Heroin, ketamine, lighter fluid, anything. Greta is the landlord of Stuart and the, yeah, she's trying, you know, she demands the, the rent be, be paid. And through her, they make a number of misogynistic jokes about women supposedly past their prime, no longer conventionally attractive, and we're encouraged to laugh at them as a matter of course rather than empathize. On Anne Nugagrain is this very optimistic and, you know, just, yeah, he's, he's the social worker who is dealing with Danny's case. How to best describe the way that he talks? You know those scenes in movies and TV shows where someone is diffusing a bomb so they're extremely careful and and gentle well imagine if uh, instead of snipping wires they were diffusing the bomb with th their words 
uh, that's that's basically how he, he talks. Like he's he's constantly careful to, to not set off the person that he's talking to. He's incredibly optimistic, loves singing, trying to get others into the bonding exercises and such that he himself loves, which of course frustrates those around him, and he really he stands out like a sore thumb, surrounded by druggies and violent you know, people and just yeah. And Kefia is a Muslim immigrant who offers to, to help with, I suppose it's not a spoiler to say, there's a, a problem with the, the hot dog stand that, um, that, that Stuart is, is using to, to make money for them. And yeah, Kifia offers that and yeah, it's, it's, the fact that Duck plays, you know, he pl he plays all of these, you know, yeah, Al almost every single character is played by him, including this Muslim, and yeah, they, they, it's basically like blackface, it's really messed up, it's pretty wild that he got away with it, and this was actually beloved for, for a long time, possibly still is. Now... I, yeah, um, there's also the, the Russian Igor, who is this, like, they really laid on thick with the former Soviet Union shady guy, like, he's got a goatee that would put Lenin's to shame, and, yeah. And then we have Papa, Stewart's father, who appears in a bunch of flashbacks and it's you know basically it's this thing of like Stuart is traumatized by you know it's it's essentially like PTSD you know he's he's constantly flashing back to the many abuses you know many times that his father hit him and it's like a lot of the the you know like the people around Stuart are kind of just as you know accustomed to it by now. They do many jokes about the child abuse that Papa subjected Stuart to, and sometimes the sound they choose for the instrument of pain even fits. I kid, a lot of the time it fits, but there's some really notable times where it doesn't. Like they are a little too happy to use the sound of wood hitting an object so hard that it snaps. They use it for like steel objects and just yeah, it's very yeah. And I. Th I think that is what I will say about right. Um, yeah, because Stuart, because Duck is playing all these characters, it means that he can't, you know, for him to be interact for these characters to be interacting with each other, there has to be some special effects stuff, you know. For that kind of thing, it's extremely useful to have a stand-in, and that is Sunis Svenikia, who originally, like, he started on this thing as just a runner. Like, he's going to be making coffee, he's going to be making little er doing errands for people, but, you know, it was realized he looks a lot like Duck. Like, from the from the side, they they look like, it's it's... Yeah, it's it's wild how much they they look alike, and yeah, the the show is very careful to never like the it it never breaks the the illusion. It's it's there's no shot where it's like okay, that is definitely not actually that character, um, and it's actually like it still holds up. They they use split screens, motion control. And I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. Um, chroma key, in order to accomplish this, and there is, you know, there are scenes where there are several of these characters played by the same actor in the same shot, and yeah, like you know, obviously, you might you might be able to tell, okay, that's you know, they don't, the duck is not a triplet. He, you know, there aren't. They must have filmed that separately. But like the eye lines and the timing, it feels like they really are all there at the same time. 
there's yeah there's great dialogue like a lot of the a lot of the best jokes are verbal which you know yeah he started on radio and then he did stand up verbal comedy is the the by by far his his strongest suit but this one does also show a strong um Something that we, you know, yeah, he's he's really great at physical comedy as well, and we had seen that some before this, but this is where it, you know, he gets more of a chance to, to show it here. A lot of the show is shot on sets. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, there's a little bit of, like, yeah. Some of it isn't on sets, but yeah, by and by and large, right. And yeah, so the the music is handled by Nikolai Pike and Bo Rasmussen, also known as Bossy Bo, or in in the radio days with Duck, Bossy Bo, and this Bo Bielke Bo, sorry. And yeah, he is one of the the rappers of the East Coast Hustlers, the the two. And let's see, yeah, and you know the the in part the show is musical, a musical show, and it is not a jukebox jukebox musical. 37 minutes of the score is right here on YouTube, and yeah, very, very catchy. Nearly every major character gets at least one song. And let's see. Yeah, and, and the you know the titular rap song from the radio days does play in you know yeah, more than just the chorus, and they wrote a new verse. For it, the um, the cinematography and editing do a really great job capturing the the mood, whether it's light or tense. And the yeah, the sound design is one of the strongest elements. You know, again, he started on the radio and he's working with you know at yeah a, a DJ, so it's quite logical. Nothing in the show really feels like just cheap. Like there's some, the the, yeah. Um, there's times where you can tell. Okay, they kind of took a shortcut there, but it doesn't feel downright cheap. Now the length varies a lot for episodes. There's some that are that are quite short. Uh, let's see. I think six or seven minutes was was one of them, and the I think the longest is fifteen minutes. And in total, the entire twenty four episode run is just over four hours. And I think if you give it three episodes, if you're not into it by the end of episode three, yeah, the rest of it probably just is not your kind of thing. And yeah, so the best elements are the humor, the heart underneath it. The worst aspect is definitely the the hatred. I would say the worst is probably the racism, the misogyny, a close second. The thing I was most worried about was that they would not have enough material for so many episodes, and mostly it exceeded my expectations. And yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was Duck. And yeah, I... Yeah. My expectations were exceeded. So I've already mentioned that the season opener and the season finale are both great. The overall season is also great. There's no episode that I don't love of this. And yeah, um, this is not on Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic at all. On IMDb, let's see. Right, it has... Um, it has two links in the 
IMDb external reviews section. I can imagine they're probably old. Neither link works anymore. Uh, I'm guessing the sites, either the sites are down or just straight up like, if if this if this particular review did not, if the review of this particular thing did not get a lot of traction, you know, after some years, maybe people weren't reading it so much, they they deleted it to, you know, server space can be expensive. There are three user reviews on IMDb. One of them's my own. And yeah. Um yeah, so the yeah, the three reviews gave it a seven, a nine, and a nine. And on the yeah, if you look at the the IMDb rating, it has an eight point one out of ten based on two and a half thousand ratings. 28.4% gave it 8, 23.1 gave it 10, 22.0 gave it 9, 14.7 gave it a 7, 5.3 gave it 6, 2.6 .6 gave it 5, 1.5 gave it 1. I can imagine those are the people who really, you know, just, just could not stand it on account of all the hatred, and I don't blame them. 0.9% gave it a 3, 0.8 gave it 4, and another 0.8 gave it 2. And that... Right, there are some, um, some practical effects as well, and those tend to work out very well. And they do this thing where... There's actually, yeah, I've already mentioned that there are violent characters on this show. There are some displays of violence, and they they often do this thing where they'll they'll shake the handheld camera, or the camera will move. You know, if someone gets punched in the face, the the camera will basically follow the fist, or there'll be you know something along those lines. And that can really increase the the impact. The yeah, the stunt work is quite good, and yeah, there's about as much violence as you would expect from Stuart Stardust, who, when he isn't committing acts of violence, may very well be like talking about it, reminiscing about it, and. That is about right. Right. So, the the DVD, which has you know yeah, has all twenty four episodes. Also has sixteen minutes of gag reel. There's ten and ten and a half minutes that are the um just like general all the various characters. There's a four-minute one that's one character who just, like, goes off. Like, it's barely a, a gag reel. It's more of, like, an, an a, I, know, I guess, almost deleted scene kind of thing. And then there's one and a half minutes of the director trying desperately to get something useful out of, I mean, I'm guessing he's, like, five years old, the kid that they hired to play Stuart Stardust in the... Uh, the flashback sequences, and they they managed to get a little bit out of them. You know, poor kid. I don't blame him. He's five. He barely understands that this is make believe. You know, there's a there's a bit where, like, the director wants him to say, you know, so he says, "Okay, repeat after me. I am Stuart Stardust," and the kid says, "You are Stuart Stardust," because you know, like, just yeah, poor thing. Um, but, but yeah, they, they did manage to eventually get some useful stuff. And yes, he does indeed wear the sailor's uniform. So I'm guessing, I, I don't know, maybe he came out the womb wearing it. And that is legitimately quite funny. And the fact that no, like, it's not even like called out by, you know, no one's like, why are you, why are you already wearing, you're obviously not a sailor. Like, I, maybe you're, maybe you're pretending to be a sailor, but it's just, yeah. And there are 39 and a half minutes of behind the scenes, 28 minutes of just like general, and they have this, like most of the time, they're all going along with this joke of, you know, oh, the reason that we have a stand-in 
is because yeah, these characters exist in the real world, but they're so you know they're they're not very responsible. It's hard to get them to to all be in the same place at the same time. So we needed a stand-in, but there's a couple of times where they break that, so that's slightly unfortunate. But it's yeah, it's very informational. And then there are three separate, you know, one of one minute, one of two and a half minutes, one of eight minutes, where they talk about specifically how they achieved the illusion of there being several characters played by the same actor in the same shot. And, you know, yeah, the, the, the first is simply just the, the split screen. The, the second is one of the, the motion control things, and the, the third one is the most, uh, you know, expansive use of the motion control. And, yeah, they do a really good job. It's, it's very, it's, you know, you, you really get a, a good idea of how this was achieved. They, they, in addition to showing some of the finished footage, which you can also see in the show, they show the partway there footage so that you yeah actually get how how it looked you know and and whether you're you know hoping to go into film yourself or you just you know kind of want to know yeah they're they're well worth watching so yeah i rate this nine damaged people coming together for the holidays out of 10 and I think a lot of the the a lot of the humor and the social commentary and such does hold up, but the you know honestly the racism was not okay then the you know it's even more like egregious now, but even at the time it just yeah, and I. I don't know if very many people are still watching this. Um, you know, hopefully, I, I don't. I don't think you should show it to children. In part because of all the hatred. You know, there's also like really adult content though. You know, I started paying attention to his stuff when I was still, you know, a, a ch yeah. I guess when I was just starting to be in a, a, a teenager thereabouts, but. Yeah, you know, I I was not 18 before I started listening to his stuff, and in retrospect, I probably should have been. And yeah, um, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite. Doesn't have to be Christmas, just like holiday themed, you know, TV show, movie, video game, any piece of media. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing small thoughts on a movie. And recently, the review thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since a movie's running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're not. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching the recording. I'll catch you next time. In the immortal words of Stuart Stardust, Au revoir.